Hello coaches, welcome back to our channel where we delve deep into the intricacies of soccer training and strategies. Today, we will explore three pivotal tips to elevate your small-sided games, SSG, and ensure your training sessions are as effective and beneficial as possible. It is well known in the coaching community that many avoid SSG, often relegating it to a mere recreational exercise. This underestimation of SSG's potential is a significant oversight. SSG's chaos and perceived randomness can make coaches feel like they are losing control of the training session, which causes discomfort and reticence to incorporate it. But let me tell you, when utilized correctly, SSG is a transformative drill. It has no equal in improving the individual basis of a player and fostering an environment that encourages creativity and strengthens the socio-effective relationships between players. What is the socio-effective advantage? The socio-effective advantage is the capacity of the players to beat opposing players with the relationship between them. Sometimes the socio-effective advantage could be more powerful than the numerical advantage. So how can we harness the full potential of SSG and mitigate the chaos? Here are three crucial tips to refine your SSG, promoting the right behaviors and amplifying the desired situations you aim to reproduce in your training sessions. Before we dive into the detailed insights, if you're finding this content valuable, please take a moment to hit the like button and share this video with other coaches or anyone interested in enhancing their soccer knowledge. Firstly, consider the shape of your SSG. Whether it's vertical or horizontal can significantly influence the types of actions during the game. A well thought out shape can encourage specific movements and interactions, adding another layer of strategy and intention to the game. The space can be small or large, wide or deep. Depending on the space we select, the player's behavior will change. Firstly, space gives us time. Depending on the player's level, they will need more time to perceive and deceive. As we said before, we must find the perfect balance to challenge our players, but not too much to make them feel frustrated and not too low to make them feel that the objective is too, too easy to achieve. The space has to provide enough time for the players to play in a challenge, challenging difficulty and rhythm, but they can achieve the goal. When we start the drill, we can analyze how it is going and depending on the difficulty, we can adjust the space to make it bigger or smaller. We don't need to stop the drill. We can open or close it when the players are playing. We must stop our drill as little as possible. The space could be wider or deeper. Depending on if it is wider or deeper will influence the actions and decisions that our players will make. The wider spaces help the players to find solutions through the flanks. Finding options in the space behind is difficult because it's reduced. Then we want to improve the concept of situations that involve attracting one side to move to the other one, switching fields or crossing situations. We must create a drill with wider space. On the other hand, if we want to work to runs in behind, the penetration runs or the one-on-one -on -one situations, we must create a deep space. A deep space helps the players to attack in deep with and without the ball. In conclusion, depending on how the space is, we will enhance different behaviors of our players. We must try to be careful, but remember that during the drill, we can also change it and adapt it. Next, let's talk about the neutrals. Their location, whether inside or outside, directly impacts the dynamics of the drill. Thoughtful positioning of the neutrals can alter the flow and focus of the game, allowing you to target specific areas of improvement. The neutrals. The neutrals will influence our drills depending on the radio between attackers and defenders and their location. As we said, the radio between attackers and defenders influences the drill. And the advantage of using neutrals is that both teams will have the same advantage and we can switch roles easily. If we want to play a 6 versus 5 with one team attacking with 6 and the other team attacking with 5, they will have a numerical disadvantage when, they, when the defensive team recovers the ball. If we play the same situation with a 5 versus 5 plus one neutral, it, it will be much easier to switch roles and keep the advantage of the game. Let's talk about the position of the neutrals. The neutrals can play in the inner or outer space during the drills. If we play with an inner neutral, this player will be active during the game because he is in the drill score. 
As we will see later, we can limit this advantage with rules for the neutral. Having an extra player in the inner space will help the players to look for the free player. They can find him by pass, dribble to create a free player, or repeat passes to track the pressure and create a new free player. Depending on the height of our outside neutrals, their roles will completely differ. If the height is too low and the neutrals play near the defender's height, they will use as a free players to beat the high press and after it connect with the space between the lines or find a free player in the space behind the back line. But if the neutrals are on the opposing half and their height is close to the box, it will be easier to look for finishing actions like crosses and last passes actions. The last option is to locate the neutrals on depth, behind the, the goal line. This neutrals position enhances the player's behaviors to look forward because the free players is there. Lastly, be open to the ways to score and be sure to reward them appropriately. Some coaches constrain the scoring methods which can detract from the realism and dismiss the inherent logic of the game. By allowing varied scoring methods and rewarding them, you maintain the essence of the game and encourage players to think and act diversely. A big mistake of coaches during those open and more free games is to limit the option to score only in one way. Let me explain. Imagine that your goal is to improve the 1 versus 1 situation in the last third, and you tell your players that the only way to score is after 1v1. That's a huge mistake. The players will only try to play 1 versus 1 situations. Another example is that you can only score if a player receives between the lines. What do you think the defenders will do? They will close the space and nobody will receive between the lines. We don't have to limit the options, we have to reward players for finding solutions by concepts we work on and reward them for finding different options from ours. We must understand that soccer is a game of consequences. The defenders will react depending on where you are want to attack. And depending on where defenders want to defend, you will have free space. Then, the same objective, find free player in a crucial space, we play a small side game where the reception behind the first line of pressing plus the goal have double value. Now the players can find different ways to score through the outside spaces by one versus one or cross situations. Still, they have the freedom to decide naturally without forcing anything, but putting an extra focus on their mindset. Remember the essence of SSG is to simulate real game scenarios in a controlled environment focusing on individual skills and team dynamics. Implementing these three tips ensures your SSG is structured, purposeful and conducive to player development. Thank you for tuning in. If you found these tips helpful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more insightful content. Keep coaching smart and see you in the next one.